Welcome and thank you for joining today's Agile Live webinar on Scaling Agile to the Program and Portfolio Levels. Version 1 is pleased to sponsor the Agile Live Thought Leadership webinar series, which are focused on helping companies scale, fast, scale Agile faster, easier, and smarter. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few logistics. The presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. For those of you who haven't used On24 before, I would like to point out a few areas on the audience console. All participants are muted throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A panel on your console. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer any, as many questions as we have time for. If we don't get to your question, we will follow up with you directly after today's webinar. In addition, if you have technical questions, please feel free to send a note through the same Q&A panel, and an ON24 representative will be happy to assist you. In addition, I would like to encourage you to enter your aha moments in the Twitter panel which you can also find on the console. You can download, download the slides from today's presentation by clicking on the slides widget at the bottom of the screen. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded, and we will be sending an email in a few days with a link to the recording. Now on to the presentation. Um, first, I would like to introduce Dave Rubenstein, um, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times, who will be our moderator today. Thanks, Lori, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be moderating this today because this is a topic we've covered extensively in SD Times. Uh, we've spoken to a lot of developers, a lot of organizations that are looking to take Agile from the team level throughout the organization. And we understand the pain they're feeling as they try to uh, work not only in a more agile way, but to actually become an agile organization. As we've been reporting in SD Times, organizations are finding success with agile at the team level, even the department level. Uh, their code's being delivered more iteratively. They're having faster releases with fewer bugs, better quality. Uh, yet they struggle to achieve the same success as they try to bring agile through to uh, other executives, business analysts, and uh, operations, among other departments. Often it's because the different teams use different tools, their processes don't always map, and uh, the communication breaks down. Now there are methods that can be used to uh, become an Agile organization, and here to tell us how to overcome these departmental disconnects to achieve agility are two of the Agile coaches from Version 1's Expanding Services team. First, I'd like to introduce Mike McLaughlin. Mike has more in 15 years of experience in software development and over five as an Agile practitioner, coach, trainer, and mentor. He has facilitated the Agile transformation at multiple Fortune 500 clients in the telecommunications, healthcare, financial services, and government sectors. He's a frequent speaker and active member of the Scaled Agile Community, the Scrum Alliance, Project Management Institute, and the Limited Work in Progress Society. And joining Mike today is Dave Gunther. Dave has more than 20 years of software product development experience, including over six years coaching and helping companies to scale Agile. He's been instrumental in multiple organizational Agile transformations and helped multiple product delivery teams achieve a cycle of continuous improvement and predictable delivery. So that's some pretty good credentials right there. Uh, now uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mike McLaughlin to get things kicked off. Mike, take it away. Okay, thanks, uh, David, for that uh, kind introduction, uh, and thanks to everybody on the call uh, today for joining us. Uh, my name is Mike, and it's a real pleasure to be with you all talking about something that we're passionate about. Um, so an Agile transition is most certainly a journey. Uh, when we look at a typical Agile adoption and transformation roadmap, um, we, we generally start out with, with Agile training, uh, you know, getting the teams up and running with Scrum, uh, the developers starting to utilize those various XP technical practices, uh, maybe Kanban for the maintenance teams. We provide some, you know, agile coaching either through consultants or, or internally. Um, you know, we create these big open team spaces to help drive the collaboration, 
maybe an agile software management tool for those, those teams that are not co-located. Co um, the list can go on, right? But, but the journey quickly becomes more complex as we begin to adopt these larger initiatives. So, you know, this involves multiple teams working on the same or multiple products, you know, the organization, communication, uh, visibility, transparency, up and down the chain to the, to the program and the portfolios. So we've been seeing this uh, increased demand to scale Agile for some time now, and it's, and it's really uh, uh, become a hot topic as of late. And, of course, that's why we're all here today. Uh, we're going to take you on a short tour, uh, one that will begin by briefly exploring this idea of complexity, and then I'm going to talk to some of the key challenges of scaling Agile. But, but the, the main focus of this today is we're going to dive into these four key areas that, that Dave and I have uh, uh, come up with that, that really require attention at the program and the portfolio levels as we scale. Right? And they are Number one, organization. Um, uh, so we'll address some of the different levels of the organizations and, uh, and, and how they can work together more effectively. Uh, the second one is roles and responsibilities, which you know, we're, we're talking what are they and, and how do they change as we, as we scale to the enterprise. The third one is communication and coordination. And that's where, this is where Dave's going to take over, um, how, how we can improve communication and better align. And then the fourth and last one is the practices and tools section. What are they and, and how can they help us? And then we'll sprinkle in a couple of brief polls. Uh, we'll wrap up uh, some concluding words of wisdom, and, and then we'll take your questions at the end. Okay, so let's kick this thing off by framing up the problem of complexity. If we, if we look at how we perform these you know, simple calculations, uh, there seems to be this innate ability to perform the, the really simple stuff. It's almost like a built-in calculator wired in our brains. But you know, we have limitations when things start getting larger and more complex, um, uh, you know, whether it's calculations or concepts. There's this idea in mathematics that's called combinatrix, and that's why I've got the the pool balls here on the, on the slide. Um, it, as the name implies, it, it really involves the calculation of combinations, right? So let's say, for example, you're, gonna, you're about to play a game of pool, and you're placing these 15 balls in the rack. How many different unique arrangements of these balls do you think could be made? I'll give you a second. What did you guess? Maybe a few hundred? Maybe several thousand? Would it shock you to find out that the answer is really 1.3 trillion with a T? In fact, if you could create a new combination of balls every second, it would take you over 41,000 years to exhaust every possibility there with those 15 balls. Another classic result of our tendency to underestimate complexity involves project planning. And so we typically look at the project as a series of discrete steps or phases. Uh, you know, that each have some, some likelihood of, of being executed successfully. What we fail to see oftentimes is this vast number of these interconnected relationships that are undergirding or, or maybe even undermining our success. Right? So if you look at a large project, you know, we've got hundreds or, or thousands of these unique elements and factors uh, with, with these complex relationships. Uh, just to name a few, people, right? politics, risks, dependencies, systems, geography, et cetera, et cetera, right? The list goes on. So as with this pool balls example, as the project gets larger, it builds up complexity, right? Soon you're, you're managing something that, that's so enormously complex that it's virtually bound to have some level of failure and almost impossible to manage. So what, what are some of the problems we're likely to encounter on our journey as we scale Agile? Um, well, we understand the importance of eliminating silos, right? We recognize that at the end of the day, it's the delivery of real working software to the customer that defines our success. But when we start getting bigger, right, it becomes clear rather quickly that these vertical layers in our organizations uh, tend to be insulated from, from one another. Um, products and services are sometimes large and require these multiple teams working on them, right? This can be a struggle. Um, as, as things become more and more complex. Uh, 
One of the areas where we've seen difficulty in large organizations is putting together the pieces of, the, of this puzzle. Right? So when you have no single team or, or iteration that's producing what we call a minimally marketable feature, right, an MMF, uh, this is an, a minimally marketable feature, by the way, is simply the smallest possible set of functionality that by itself has value in the marketplace. So a single team can do great work, but in order to have value in the marketplace, it needs to be a cohesive unit that provides value to the customer. So in a scaled or agile organization, the ability to integrate and deploy the work of multiple agile teams uh, work into something useful is, is paramount here. Right? But, the, but what we find is that the larger organization often does not have the capability to do this. Right? A lot of organizations try to scale agile without recognizing the challenges they're going to run into. Right? It seems simple because it works well at the team level. Additionally, there's often a disconnect between the folks who are investing in the product, right, in the upper left-hand side of that screen, and, and those that are actually creating it. So to deal with this, you know, even so-called agile organizations, and I've been uh, a part of these before, um, continue to, to kind of rely on these traditional program and project management uh, tools to, to try to organize and coordinate the work of their agile teams. Right? So, you know, we've shown that, that, that Gantt charts don't work very well at the team level, uh, so why would we expect much success at, uh, with this model as we scale? So now we come to the first of our four areas of focus, which is the organization. Right. In short, what we do is we execute at the project level, we coordinate at the program level, and then we develop <clears throat> strategy at the portfolio level. Right? So those goals are still very valid and very real. The opening here really lies in reevaluating the methods uh, in which we realize these levels at scale. Um, so in the scaled agile organization, the value is really delivered at the program level. Right. This is where, where features are delivered in a, in a potentially shippable increment, a PSI, um, by way of a release. Right? So this diagram clearly shows how these three layers work together and depend upon each other. Right? At the very top level, you'll see there the portfolio level, you, we're deciding what, business, what the business initiatives uh, we're going to take on. Right? So those, those initiatives could provide value to the customer or maybe some architectural improvement that's necessary to move the needle. Uh, each of these, these business initiatives will likely have multiple features. Okay? So the, the, the program level manages those features. And if we jump one down, um, so features, just a level set, those are just enhancements to the product that the user would find some value in. Right? So uh, we recognize that there may be multiple teams that are needed to realize these features. So ultimately, these features are broken down into these more granular uh, levels called uh, user stories, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And, that, and then uh, down at the project uh, or the team level is where the, the, the team actually delivers the work of those user stories. Right? So that's, that's kind of the organization. So we can see the flow and the dependencies that are involved here. Right? As the features are approved by the portfolio at the top, the folks at the program level define and break those down. The product owners can at this point begin refining those uh, further into the user stories and the acceptance criteria, the more granular criteria. And then, of course, the team develops and tests those stories, where once they're completed, they move back up the chain, right, to be approved and ultimately delivered into production as part of a release. Um, of course, in, in, in scaled agile environments, this, this, may be, this team may be one of many. But this is the basic organizational structure here. Okay, safe. At this time, the, the scaled agile framework, SAFE, uh, is arguably uh, the most well-considered and thought-out framework for this purpose, right? You've got to love the catchy acronym here. Who, who doesn't really want to be SAFE, right? Um, this is a relatively new framework created by Dean Leffingwell. Uh, essentially, what SAFE does is it scales what we've learned to do well at the team level to the rest of the enterprise. 
Um, it's, take, it, it's worth taking note here of, of the word framework, okay? Um, safe is, is really meant to be suggestive rather than prescriptive. So some of, I know there's some, some folks out there um, uh, who oppose or, or question safe and suggest it tends uh, a bit toward being a methodology, uh, including uh, a bit too many rules and procedures. But what I'm seeing uh, on the field is that, that many organizations are actually looking for a more prescribed approach, especially when they first start out, right, at least initially. And then they inspect and adapt the way they work, like, like any good agilist would do. And, and I might also mention that it's worth noting that, that Scrum is also a framework, right? And I've heard some folks that have the same criticism of, of Scrum. Um, I should also mention here that, that SAFE is not the only solution to scaling Agile. Many organizations out there have their own homegrown models, um, and there are, there are a couple of others out there on the web. Um, however, it is the most widespread at, the time, at this time, and it has a track record in many large enterprises. So if you want to look, look for uh, more on that, just Google it or go to, they've got a really cool website. It's called scaledagileframework.com, all one word, um, and it's a, it's a very interactive uh, site. You can learn more about it. Okay, as we're talking about the organization here, I would be amiss if I didn't give some love to the House of Lean. Right? So as you can see here circled in red, uh, the management support is really the foundation of this house. So first and foremost, this requires that management be trained in lean thinking, right? There's, there's an increased focus on eliminating waste. We're constantly on the lookout for ways to be more efficient in the way that we work. Um, we're basing our decisions on a, on a long-term philosophy. Uh, continuous improvement or Kaizen, right? Uh, we're, we're pushing that. So as a manager, you're, you're looking to support your organization in, in these, these types of lean approaches, right? You're a servant leader, you're a coach, a teacher, and, a, and an advocate of, of Kaizen. Okay, so I think we've got our first poll question here. Cool. Um, so the question, how many planning levels do you have in your organization? Select one answer, and it can be other as well. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you about 15, 20 seconds, and then we'll move on and see what the results look like, okay? Okay, I'm going to move on and see what, uh, what you guys chose here. Oh, interesting. Okay, so three. Yeah, I expected to see a lot of threes. Um, I see some ones, some twos, some few fives, and, yeah, a few others. So mostly, it looks like mostly threes, uh, quite a few fours, uh, twos and fives uh, kind of equally spread there, uh, and a few ones. So, you know, interesting results. Um, so companies are different in the way that they're organized. Uh, we recognize that. The ones, the, the ones that I've been at, which have traditionally been larger organizations, have, have those basic three levels. Um, but, you know, some are more flat. Others are more hierarchical, so they may have more. Uh, but the structure of your organization is going gonna, is gonna to determine the way in which it operates and the way in which it performs, right? So it really provides that foundation uh, that your processes rest upon. And it will also help kind of determine, you know, which, which individuals or which roles uh, participate in, in which decision-making process, right, and therefore to what extent those views will shape the organization. Okay, that's cool. I like that poll. Okay, on to roles and responsibilities. Let's dive into the second of our four areas of focus, which is roles and responsibilities. Um, the team is the thing, right? If we, have a, if we have any rugby fans out there, you'll probably recognize this. It's the uh, New Zealand uh, All Blacks doing the haka. They do this uh, prior to uh, the start of the game. It's pretty cool. Um, if you haven't seen it uh, on YouTube, check it out when you get a couple minutes. It's, it's pretty funny uh, and intimidating at the same time, especially to the other team. So we're looking for, at the team level here, guys. We're looking uh, for these, this, these dynamic interactions self-organization, the confidence to question. Uh, we also recognize that strong teams are hard to build, 
right? You've got to get the right mix of folks. They've got to be on board. Um, but even more important uh, is, is the culture in which they operate, right? And that's driven by leadership. So, you know, after all, it's, at the end of the day, it's the team that delivers the, the valuable working software at the end of each iteration. Okay, so getting to the project team level roles, right, the development, you've got the, uh, the coders, the testers, the designers. Um, teams are typically organized to deliver software features or components. So most enterprises have some, some mix of both, right? The component teams are, are they, they actually, they build the distinguishable system parts, right, that capture those shared functions that, that we need to implement the features, right? We're talking here about DBAs, architects, user interface designers, et cetera, et cetera. The feature team, right, those are the folks that build the product features and services that directly meet our users' needs, okay? And then, of course, I think everybody knows the product owner and the scrum master, right? Product owner is really, you know, kind of the, the responsible for the ROI. They accept the work that the team delivers. They, they define and prioritize that backlog at the team level. And the scrum master or the agile pro project manager, as some folks call it, they're, they're more of a, a guide, right? They guide the processes, the framework. Uh, they, they, uh, they help remove impediments. They're, they're servant leaders. So now let's move up to the program level and talk about this. Um, I think we'd all agree here that the Scrum imperative, right, which is delivering customer value every iteration or sprint, is a nice thing, right? But when we start talking about complex systems of systems, a team may not actually be able to deliver something valuable to the customer, right? Um, furthermore, it may not be possible for a team to perform the integration and the system testing and the deployment of what it actually creates. So Scaled Agile really allows us a way to systematically, predictably integrate the work of multiple teams into something that's valuable to the customer. Right? So some of the questions you might want to ask here at this program level, right? how do we organize teams to, to help optimize our delivery? Uh, who works on what and where? Uh, do we want to organize around the features or the components or products or services? Uh, how many backlogs should there be? Right? Who's going to manage those backlogs? Uh, how, how, are all these, how are all these multiple teams going to communicate? How's that going to actually occur? Um, and how are we going to coordinate the activities so that we can, we can bring this together and produce this one big solution? So as to the specific roles at the program level, um, these, are, these are example roles, by the way, right? This, this isn't necessarily safe, specific, and, but we, we tried to kind of generalize these to, to a degree. So the, the release management team, right, they're, they're determining the readiness of a product or a release. In other words, they decide when and how the solution should be delivered to the users. Um, this includes the stakeholders, the product managers, the program managers, marketing managers, line management, uh, deployment folks, maybe some senior level QA, et cetera, et cetera. The system team, these are the folks that help to integrate and test and deploy those full solutions. Right? This includes the testers and the other folks that build and integrate and test a complete product or, or system. And then the product management, right? this, this role is kind of akin to the product owner role at the team level but for the solution as a whole at the program level. Right? So typical roles include you know, program manager or product manager. Um, this is the person that's ultimately responsible for that end-to-end -end solution. Right? We're talking uh, about not just the scope of the release, but also the distribution and the documentation, uh, the support, the messaging, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, this is my favorite slide. The portfolio, the Easy Bake Oven. The easy to bake portfolio management office, right? Ideas come in, ideas and money go in, and perfect software comes out. Right? Got to love the analogy here. So for enterprises struggling to adopt Agile, there's, there's oftentimes this huge disconnect at the portfolio or the executive level. Right? The PMOs are, are treated as black boxes where we enter, uh, you know, demands and budget uh, along with unrealistic expectations. So we, we have to we've come up with this mechanism to bridge this gap. So at the portfolio level, uh, the roles, we have the, the product leadership team, right? They help de define and prioritize the portfolio. Uh, the decisions made here end up driving those releases. Uh, and this, this team will consist mostly of, of business stake 
uh, stakeholders, product managers, and other leaders in the development organization. The enterprise architecture team, right, those are mostly senior technical leaders, architects, uh, the folks that manage the, the, the technology strategy, right. Um, uh, the agile transformation team, right, that's more of a broad representation from all areas of the organization, right. But primarily you're going to see that coming from the agile, uh, you know, the PMO or maybe the center of excellence, um, whatever you might call it. But this team drives things like, you know, communities of practice, communities of interest. Uh, they, they look at impediments and help to analyze those and help to, to remove them. Um, we, we typically find members from both the, both the business and the technical areas. So you'll, you'll see agile coaches, you know, line managers, C-level executives, uh, just generally anybody with a passion for agile and transforming the organization. Okay. So, I've talked about the first two key areas to focus on when planning to scale Agile, right? The organization, and we just wrapped up the roles and responsibilities. So my good friend and colleague Dave Gunther is going to take you the rest of the way, starting with the topic of communication. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Mike. Um, that was great. I enjoyed the first half there. That was um, very intriguing. Um, and as Mike mentioned, you know, we have those two, two big challenge areas when we're scaling, <clears throat> one being around the organization. And we talked a lot about having those three levels, um, the portfolio program and the team level. Uh, but it was interesting to see in the poll that some are even dealing with more levels in their organization to deal with and plan around. So that, that was interesting insight. Um, it was also good to get some understanding of the kinds of roles that we're, we're going to need in, in scaling and seeing his examples of those. And again, Mike pointed out how complex this whole thing is, right? This isn't an easy journey to, to scale Agile, and so we're acknowledging that and recognizing some of those challenges. One of the big challenges is really around communication and alignment, making sure that we are talking and that we're, we all know what we're working on and the value that we're trying to deliver and how we're doing it and being able to align organiza organizationally with the mission and, and trying to um, achieve the value that we're after. So communication at the team level is one thing. Um, communicating across teams and organizations is another. And before we dive into this too much, let's just step back for a minute and remember the manifesto and the Agile principles. Because as we consider scaling Agile, it's a good idea to reflect and look back at the manifesto and make sure that it, that it applies, right? In fact, in our um, SAFE certification class, one of the exercises was to actually evaluate the principles and decide, do any of them not apply at scale? And the outcome of that was really that, while the language might need to change a little bit, all the principles basically apply, right? And so we want to make sure we hold on to that and not lose sight of what we're really after here. And some of the um, core principles here um, in the manifesto to, to take note of are really around communication. And a lot of what we've solved at the team level um, as part of Scrum and Agile is getting folks to work closer together and to communicate better, right? So we emphasize individuals and interactions, collaboration, face-to-face -face communication whenever possible. And, you know, business people and developers working together. Ah, what a concept, right? So that's big changes from the waterfall days. And so we want to keep these kinds of um, directions um, going as we scale up beyond the team. So now not only do we want communication face-to-face -face between developers, but we want to extend that throughout the organization to be aligned. And it turns out we can scale that. What do we communicate about? So what are kind of the key communication components that we want to make sure are covered when we communicate across programs and portfolios and across teams? What are we aligning around, right? And the big one is really a common vision, goals, objectives, right? So we oftentimes will establish goals or, or a vision up at the highest portfolio level or even at the executive organization level. 
and those will break down perhaps into sub goals and objectives throughout the programs. And we really don't want to lose sight of those high level um, visions. So communicating those throughout the three levels and across the teams is critical. Um, I've been in a lot of organizations where this isn't necessarily clear and it results in a lot of work in progress and, and, uh, ideal, and not very good alignment towards what we're trying to achieve as an organization. So that's critical. Priorities. So now we're talking about being able to manage priorities at the portfolio level and have those priorities be um, propagated all the way down to the teams. So we have to have a good understanding of what our priorities are um, to meet the vision of the organization and communicate those at all times, right? In some cases, there's a disconnect. And often when we have small pockets of Agile, we're really good at having clear priorities for the team and the backlogs, but as you roll up into the priorities of the organization, they, they either misalign um, or, or they're inconsistent. Content, so what is it that we're working on? Not only do we need to understand the priority, but we need to know the what. So this is the backlog, right, at the team level. What stories are the next priority? We need to scale that to, okay, what features are the next priority to deliver value at the program level? And then even beyond that, what are the initiatives at the portfolio level that those roll up to? So we have to have clear communication as to what those initiatives are and how we're breaking those down to deliver the value. So what is it that we're working on needs to be clear to everybody. What are the dependencies and impediments and risks so that, you know, now that we have multiple teams that are depending on each other and systems that have clear dependencies and have multiple teams working against common code bases, you know, identifying dependencies has always been a challenge. It becomes even more important when we're delivering bigger systems as a whole and impediments and risks, right? We want to understand those and make those visible at all times so we can address them um, beyond just the team level. Plans and forecasts. So to a certain degree we want to plan, right, as much planning as makes sense. Um, we do a good job planning at the sprint level in, in that we can plan what we're going to commit to in the next sprint as a team, um, but we, we don't have a standard way traditionally of doing higher level planning. And SAFE has accommodated this by doing what they call PSI planning at the program level, where you decide for 8 to 12 teams, what are you going to deliver over the next um, 12, 10 or 12 months, right? So there's a release planning effort that goes on. It's a two-day effort, and it involves almost everybody involved in the program. And the nice thing is, is it helps bridge the communication issues that happens and, and get everybody aligned towards a common vision, understand what you're working on, and actually have a plan for delivering um, and to some predictable milestone in the, in the midterm future. Um, so having a plan and a forecast that people can understand and align to is important. Um, we also need to think about forecasting because we want to make sure we understand where we're going. And so this implies quite a bit here, right, because not only we can no longer only rely on the velocity of a team against their, their backlog, but now we're talking about um, either initiatives or feature backlogs where we need to understand how fast we're moving and how big that backlog is to move forward. So there's some estimation consideration there as well. We need to understand capacity and load, right? So. We do this, again, at the team level, we understand what our capacity is as a team, and we know how many points we can do, roughly, um, to be sustainable. Um, but it's harder to see this at the organizational level. And because of that, it's, it's an often, often a trap for organizations that they end up having too much work in progress. There's pockets of work being done that isn't even made visible, and the result is that we actually move slower than expected. So really getting to the point where you can understand the comp true capacity of your organization and how you, you can better plan how much you can do and prioritize those most important things. And oftentimes that results in having to say no to certain things, right, because you realize you're over capacity. 
architecture and UX, so another area of alignment. We need to um, have some higher level architecture path that we can follow um, as teams. And so it's sort of that just enough architecture to keep all the teams moving and the systems moving in the right direction. Um, but still, you know, supporting that agile architecture mentality of allowing the architecture to emerge as the teams develop the software. So in SAFE, they have what's called an architectural runway, which is kind of that concept. At a high level, it provides the runway for the teams to, um, to follow to get started and move in the same direction, but still allows the architecture to emerge at the team level. Same with UX, the same kind of concepts apply. And finally, knowledge. So we, we recognize that one of the risks with Scrum and team level Agile is that we get this sort of what, we, what I've heard called localized optimization, where one team or a couple teams get really, really good at Agile, right? And they get really, really good at learning and, and advancing their tool set and delivering um, better quality code. But that information and knowledge is often kept within the team, right? Or the, the other teams don't mature at the same rate. And when we start thinking about bigger organizations and delivering amongst a team of teams, then one optimized team or one localized component of a system doesn't really help us deliver a bigger program. So. Um, that's just one example, and so we've got to learn how to share knowledge and learn together at the, organ at, at the program level, not just at the team level, so we can move forward together and keep all teams um, aligned. So how do we enable technology, or, I'm sorry, enable communication? You know, the big, the big thing here is uh, there's just three points, and we could come up with a lot of ways to improve communication. But just a few here. One is embrace technology. Um, we all know that we have things like video conferencing and social media, even agile project management tools that allow us to address a lot of communication challenges. And we've had to do that and use those facilities for dealing with, with uh, remote teams. Um, but now we're talking about really taking advantage of that technology to, um, to enable communication up and down the chain. And part of that is preparing the facilities. So we want to make sure we have uh, whiteboards and uh, shared monitors and video conferencing and all those other facilities that, en that enable communication. The other thing about facilities is now all of a sudden we're talking about planning in bigger, in bigger groups, right? So um, SAFE promotes the idea of doing a two-day release planning session with up to 125 people in one room. So you have to make sure that if you're going to start tackling these broader planning efforts, that you have the facilities to support it. Not just the technology to support the communication, but even just the space, right? And so we're no longer talking about team rooms only. We're talking about bigger and broader spaces to allow collaboration. And ultimately, the big advantage we have is that we have a cadence typically established by a Scrum team. And that allows them to do regular communication at daily stand-ups, um, sprint reviews, sprint planning sessions, retrospectives, right, on a, on, a, on a cadence, meaning usually every two weeks or some, something close to that. So we have an opportunity to plan more synchronization and ceremonies around the, that cadence. And not only that, but extend that same cadence across the organization. And that will allow common calendar points in which to do synchronization and help with alignment and communication. So here's an example of how the cadence can help. So we have teams down below, two teams contributing to a program, program A. And ultimately, there's multiple programs that are rolling up into a portfolio. And so you'll see here that we have this cadence established by every sprint, and we can begin to extend that cadence across the organization. So it would be a good idea for your multiple teams to share the same sprint schedule and have all the teams under a program share that same sprint schedule. 
um, and align the programs to a common cadence as well so we can synchronize at the portfolio level. Right? So the idea here is capitalize on this cadence. First of all, establish a common cadence. And second of all, capitalize on it and build in synchronization points along those points where we're usually delivering working software, getting feedback and making changes and pivoting, right? All those agile concepts. So let's step back a little bit from communication. We recognize that's important. Hopefully I've given you guys some ideas there on how to improve it, things to think about as you scale. The other and fourth concept that we want to talk about is practices and tools, right? So we need to rethink somewhat our practices and think about tools that help us at scale, right? And I kind of broke this category into four subcategories. Um, so the big one around practices in my mind is that focus on quality. And it sounds sort of trite and yeah, we've heard it before and yeah, we do it every day. Um, but it becomes more important when you're extending um, delivery across teams that each team is delivering some known quality level, right? Because now we're taking software delivered by multiple teams and integrating it into a bigger system and really the quality of that bigger system is only as good as the quality of one of the teams, right? So that if any team is not adhering to quality, it becomes apparent at the, at the higher level. So you're only as strong as your weakest point. So a focus on quality is key when we talk about software development practices. The second one is broadening good practices and ceremonies. So the things that are working well in, in Agile at the team level Let's go ahead and, and carry those forward. So things like retrospectives, they seem to work really well at the team level, ensuring that continuous improvement and reflection. So let's go ahead and think about those kinds of ceremonies and extend them to the program and portfolio level. And starting to get into the tools, we want to we be able to expose or make visible um, and coordinate the value delivery hierarchy. So this is kind of a mouthful but it's really that hierarchy of content that we're delivering from the initiatives to the features to the user stories. We have to be able to manage that and manage the priority and manage the value that we're delivering and how we're delivering it. And often that requires a tool. So we have to acknowledge that oftentimes when we extend beyond the teams, um, whiteboards and scrum boards don't always work to get to all the level of information you need. And then sort of an overarching umbrella, and this is promoted in SAFE as well, is this idea of thinking lean. Now that we're extending beyond a team and thinking about system-wide um, efforts as a whole, delivering huge things by, with multiple teams, we need to think about optimizing the system as a whole, not just optimizing at the local level. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, and Mike talked about the House of Lean, um, but we'll revisit that briefly in a minute. So with regard to practices in, in engineering, um, as, as I emphasized, the, the key is code quality, right? We're talking quality here. We want to make sure that all the teams are delivering to a certain standard because we're all integrating together. And XP practices are key to that. Um, in fact, some the line is getting a little blurry in some cases as to what's Scrum and what's XP because Scrum teams are recognizing that in order to really deliver value every sprint and have fully working tested software, then these types of practices become critical, right? So we're acknowledging this and promoting it as something that for engineering teams to, to, to focus on. And there are really these five, five six areas, I guess. Um, agile architecture, right? And this is that concept of don't try to design it all up front but do just enough design to get all of the teams going and aligned, and then allow architecture to emerge as we learn and develop sprint to sprint, right? So we want to continue to promote that. Continuous integration, you know, the idea that we only know how good our code is until we've integrated with all the, um, the, the pieces that, that puzzle pieces Mike mentioned that need to come together to deliver. Um, so the more often we can integrate with other teams and learn what's going on and, and fix things as we go, the better. So continuous integration becomes critical and something that teams should be striving for. 
Um, we've talked about test first development, this idea of you know test driven development, and really this is a good practice at the team level to um, understand how we're going to test something before we build it um, and build sometimes automated tests to develop around, right? So build quality in from the beginning. Refactoring, we recognize that as we learn and things change that refactoring becomes um, sometimes necessary and required, so we have to build that in and expect to be doing it. And refactor the areas of code that we know that are going to um, support future functionality. Pair working, right? Pair programming is a, is a big buzzword. And really the idea here is to share knowledge and expertise across teammates, right? And solve problems together. Um, we want to extend this knowledge, this, this concept, not only you know, amongst individuals on the team, but perhaps across teams. Wouldn't it be nice if some features could be worked on by any team as opposed to just one person, let alone two people on one team? So this concept can be scaled as well. And finally, collective ownership, right? So we don't, it's not this individual that owns this piece of code, and now it's not even the team that owns this piece of code, right? We're talking about a program ownership here. So we've got to start thinking at that level. Ceremonies. So we talked a little bit about engineering tools. Now let's touch on ceremonies here. So we're talking about grooming sessions, planning sessions, demos and reviews, and retrospectives. I would consider um, having all of these ceremonies uh, be considered at scale, right? So grooming, we're talking about doing that at the user story level with the teams. We're talking about grooming features and bigger epics, as Steve calls them, at the portfolio level, I'm sorry, at the program level. And then we're talking about continuously grooming and better understanding what our initiatives are at the portfolio level, right? And if you have five levels in your organization, I'm curious if there's multi-levels of content as well there too. But the point is that it's, it, there's grooming that needs to be done. There's, um, this is the big alignment component of the content, right? And estimation may kind of come along with that. Planning. So now we need to prioritize not only uh, team backlogs, but have that prioritization be consistent with the feature priority at the program level and the initiative priority at the organization level. So that when the portfolio team looks at the portfolio, they can recognize that these are our top five uh, priority initiatives, and we can roll down into the features that are going to deliver that, as well as the stories below that, right? So we need to have that planning hierarchy. We have to recognize that even at the portfolio, there's still going to be a need for um, people to understand how big things are. What are we investing in? How much do we need to invest in this item? Estimation becomes somewhat of a controversial topic. Um, there's this concept of normalizing story, story points um, to get to common, est common estimation scale um, going up the chain. Um, but there's other ways to do estimation as well, right? But, but we don't want to lose sight of our success with estimation that we've had at the team level, which is don't spend a lot of time on it. Think relative sizing versus time, right? Those important concepts at the team level we need to carry forward and not get too hung up on time. Um, and planning sessions. Now we're talking planning at the portfolio level. I mentioned the SAFE model that has a two-day planning session every quarter-ish time frame. And so it's a big investment. Um, and the idea is to plan far enough ahead to where you can coordinate with the other teams and understand dependencies and things like that. But it's also important to do this um, with everybody, right? So we need the business involved. You know, think back to the manifesto. We want the business and the developers working together. We really want to leave planning with an aligned understanding of where we're going as a program that's consistent with the portfolio goals. Demos and reviews, we can extend beyond teams. Okay, so um, when we integrate with, with multiple teams, we should have a demo and involve those other teams, and, and it's an opportunity to communicate and align and change direction if we need to. Makes sense to, to scale that. Retrospective, same thing. We want to 
just like we um, inspect and adapt at a sprint level, we can inspect and adapt at a release level, and we can inspect and adapt at the portfolio level when we move on to new initiatives, right? What worked well, what didn't work well, and what are we going to commit to doing differently as an organization to make things better? So here's just kind of a, a, a visual here um, showing uh, the multi-levels we talked about, the three levels, and the types of uh, ceremonies that you might consider at these levels. So we're talking about initiative grooming and ranking at the portfolio level, um, all the way down to story grooming at the team level. And the big point here that maybe isn't clear in the slide is that these should really overlap, right? So we want representatives from the teams in the program retrospectives, and we want representatives from the programs in the portfolio retrospectives. We really want to blend that communication and make sure it's all aligned and connected. Okay, some of the other um, key points here um, is that we have uh, portfolio planning and funding at the top. So that's a big, maybe a little bit different ceremony at the portfolio level um, versus down below, we might have daily retrospectives, right? The point is there's a cadence here that's built on top of the sprint schedules that can be um, allow for alignment for these ceremonies um, as we deliver. Managing the value delivery hierarchy. I know this is the mouthful, right? So the point here is, as an organization, you need to be clear on how you're, you've organized your work into these um, levels, right? So we have big initiatives at the portfolio level that we allocate investment or budget to. And then down below that we have features, typically one step smaller or epics that are delivered at the program level. And those can then be broken down into stories that teams deliver in sprints. And so understanding this hierarchy is critical and giving visibility to that is very important. The top level, we're talking about initiatives, right? This is where the funding is happening. So it needs to be really clear what the priorities there are. And we need to understand what that funding is and what the priorities are. And then we can build releases or um, deliverables at the program level on a, a mid to short term basis. So usually quarterly we can anticipate delivering some value against those initiatives um, in a certain time frame. And that's usually accomplished by planning amongst multiple teams that are doing the development, right? So we want all that to roll up. So we're starting to add some dimensions here to this hierarchy. And you can tell it quickly gets complicated in terms of every, all the different information areas we need to manage. We've got systems. We've got status. We've got forecasts. We've got risks. We've got capacity. We've got tools. We've got work in progress. We've got people. We've got code, we've got defects, unfortunately, we've got dependencies. And all of this gets really complex, right? And it's easier to manage at the team level. And as soon as you get up to more than one team, we get to this complexity model that Mike brought up at the beginning of the presentation, right? How many different combinations of data and um, dimensions of our organization do we need to track and understand and coordinate with and align with? Right? It becomes complicated. And the point here is really um, to expect to need tools to be able to help you manage this. Right? Um, version 1 has a tool, and I'm not necessarily promoting that tool specifically. There are a lot of good um, agile management tools, um, but it, it's one thing to, th to, to think you can get away with managing at the team level on a scrum board um, with a backlog in Excel. Um, but once you're scaling to teams and developing against programs and, under, and you know, tracking all those dimensions, it becomes much more complex. So it usually becomes top of mind for organizations that are beginning to scale is that we need a tool, right? And oftentimes the tool comes later. Good idea to think about it earlier if you can. Not only, um, by the way, not just um, agile project management tools, but I'm talking about you know, tools to manage development and integration and code repositories and all those kinds of tools that become critical to manage um, at scale. 
So really, though, out of that whole mess, we want to make sure it's always clear on what our big initiatives are and how those align with what we're working on, right, and how we're delivering against those big initiatives so we can align the organization. If you flip this chart on its side, you'll notice that, um, and I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I'll go through this quickly, but there's work in progress at the team level. And we're good at managing that work in progress by only taking on as much as we can accomplish in a sprint. And so we can manage how much work we can realistically and sustainably do. As we scale up, we need to understand what our, what our capacity limits are at, at the team level and at the program level, and ultimately recognize that at the portfolio level, we need to make hard decisions about we can't, what we can and can't work on. And so oftentimes organizations don't have the information to be able to do this, and so we end up with too much work in progress. So a key output of scaling Agile and doing it in a tool is recognizing where your work in progress limits are and being able to only take on the, the work you know you can get done sustainably and at the highest quality. And so usually there's a line in your portfolio of this is how much we can work on now, and then we have to make hard decisions about what not to work on. Okay, just a quick summary of Lean here. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the idea here and the concept is that now we're, we're moving from um, optimizing at the team level to now thinking about a system as a whole. And as soon as we get into that system thinking mindset, we start to recognize that we can look now at the whole value stream, now that it's all under Agile, of the point from the point that we identify an opportunity all the way until we deliver and start to optimize that flow, right, and eliminate waste and, op and Im improve the flow and, and basically optimize our delivery. And Lean has a lot of principles that allow us to, um, to think about things that way. And I encourage you to think about it and look at it further uh, but the main point here is it's a good thing to be thinking about um, now that we can think about the system as a whole. All right. We're getting close to the end here. Um, I appreciate your patience. Uh, we gave you guys a lot of information today. I'm hoping that you guys got a lot out of it. Um, we'd like to get a little bit more out of you uh, before we um, go into Q&A. And so just take a few seconds to, to answer this poll. So for, of the four um, attention areas we described when scaling Agile, what do you think your biggest challenge area is in your organization? Where are the biggest areas of challenge for you? And you can select more than one if you have challenges in more than one area, but we're really looking for like what's the big one, right? What, what's really keeping you from succeeding at scaling? Okay, give one more second, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see where we are. Wow, all over the board. I guess that's not too surprising, right? We've got communication and alignment is the big one, and organization is another big one. Practices and tools and roles and responsibilities, not so much. Interesting. But I guess what I'm taking out of this is it's a little bit all over the board, right? And I, I, that's kind of what I expected is, um, and, and that's sort of the, one of the messages here is this is complicated, right? There's a lot of organizational change that needs to happen. And so what we're recognizing is we need to plan for this change. We need to plan and address these four areas we've discussed and make sure that we have a, a, a reasonable plan for, for getting there, right? Like Agile, scaling Agile is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it would be nice if we have some team level Agile to start with and then recognize that as we scale, we need to address all of these challenge areas. With that, I'm going to wrap it up here. We're running out of time. I'm going to pass it back uh, to Dave Rubenstein. And um, if we don't have time for questions, we'll make sure uh, to follow up with you guys afterward if you've submitted questions. And thank you for having us today, and here's Dave. Great. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Dave and Mike, that was great. I just want to say, you know, uh, you know, from our point of view, we talk to a lot of people about scaling Agile. 
but uh, these were really some very specific steps and methods that you can take that really can help you achieve it uh, so it becomes less of a vague notion of scaling Agile to a more specific uh, execution plan. I thought that was a, a great presentation. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a ton of questions, so I say time limits, schmime limits. We're going to go as long as we can to answer as many as we can, and uh, we'll start off with this one. This kind of feeds off the last point you were making, Dave. Uh, one of the attendees asks, Agile speaks clearly to the changes uh, at the team level in structure, uh, practices, process like that. Uh, what, if any, willingness do you see at the senior management level to adopt concrete changes in how they operate day to day? Assuming that uh, you know you're taking uh, agile from the team level and scaling it up as opposed to a top-down approach. Yeah, right. I think um, that's a good point. And I, one of our intentions was to emphasize this a point that um, when scaling agile, you really need to have organizational buy-in, right? Just like going agile, you really need to have that executive buy-in to be able to do it. Um, and otherwise, you lose out on that alignment. Right, and and you'll run into problems. Um, so you can see that when we when we talk about structuring scaling, it, it's 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 very deliberate. Right, we have planning levels, um, we have role changes. We have to get that executive buy-in to move forward. Um, and again, some of the challenges are sort of traditional to the agile challenges. Is yeah, well, you know, we want to go agile, but we have these other projects that need to work this way. Um, we don't have enough knowledge at the executive level to do it. So a lot of times um, uh, executives need coaching and training to understand the concepts of Agile to even understand it at scale. That seems to be one of the big ones. Is it's not a comfort zone still for a lot of executives to really make sure that that organizational buy-in is driven from the top down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, to uh, keep it moving, I think uh, this might uh, address something that Mike was talking about earlier. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the question is, how do you handle planning in an agile environment when there are extensive dependencies and touch points in a project slash program? Uh, I know the idea is JIT, J-I-T, but other teams need to know well in advance when they are expected to interface. What is realistic? Yeah, so you know, I think at the program level, when we're when we're coordinating the work of all those teams, it's it really becomes a matter of the release planning um, events, right? And and so you know, if you look at you know the the scaled agile framework, for example, I mean, we're really pulling together all those teams and and coordinating and communicating. You know, hey, what is it that you're working on? What is it that this other team's working on? How does that all sort of tie up into some? You know, I think I I had a, a a, a, a slide on this about that minimally marketable feature, right? So what what becomes that? And and I think to your question, you know, how can we get really you know practical about this? That that is one of those ceremonies, if you will, uh, within uh, the scaled agile framework that I think it does a great job of tying you know of bringing together all those interested parties, you know, getting everything up on a board. Someplace, and it doesn't have to be a tool necessarily in these in these sessions, right? It can just be, you know, uh, as Dave mentioned, you know, 100 people in a room, or you know, 20 or 50 or whatever the the size of your organization, and just you know, saying, look, um, this is what we want to do. Um, how are we going to do it, right? And and ensuring that that all, um, you know, all that work and all those activities are coordinated. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I know uh, one of the things that uh, you touched on was the um, scaled framework, uh, and one of our attendees wants to know, uh, does the scaled framework align to the values and principles in the Agile Manifesto? Uh, if not, which principles or values have been altered? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a uh, – Dave, you can chime in here uh, if you like after – um, I, I think, you know, when you look at the Agile Manifesto and you look at Scaled and you say, eh, you know, some of the stuff in SAFE is maybe a little um, top-heavy or, or a bit much on the uh, procedures and the uh, um, prescription, if you will, uh, and, I, and I've heard that, right? But um, like I said, you know, I think I mentioned this as part of the first half is, you know, I see a lot of organizations that, 
Um, you know, they want some level of prescription, uh, you know, at least up front, so that they, they've got something to start with. Um, as far as it, uh, safe being agile, I, I think, you know, if you, if you look on their website and if you, if you were to, to talk with Dean Luffingwell, I, I think uh, he would say, you know, yeah, we, we encompass Scrum, we encompass, uh, um, you know, XP and all these, these other elements, Lean for sure, um, you know, all agile, all things that fit under the agile umbrella. And, uh, um, but, yeah, I've heard the other, the other side of that too, and I, I can appreciate both, both perspectives. Dave, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, only in that you know you know I've looked at the at the the manifesto in regard to scaling, and, and my opinion is that it can scale, and albeit the wording isn't um, necessarily always appropriate, um, but the concepts are there, and I think it's important that we that we recognize that because it'll be easy and is is to get into the trap of being too prescriptive. And maybe being to you know this methodology is the best way to do things. Period, as to really focus on you know what we've proven has been consistent for the last you know 10, 12 years in terms of the manifesto at the team level, and really try to capitalize on what really has been working. Um, so I, I challenge anyone to send in any thoughts as to maybe one portion of the manifesto that you think we've lost sight of as we scale. Be interesting. That would be. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, I know one of the uh, points of the manifesto, of course, is to keep things light, don't do too much upfront requirements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, somebody uh, asks, how do you keep things lightweight in terms of like minimal ceremonies and low overhead and still scale up to program and portfolio levels? Right. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think what we're acknowledging is that there is there has to be some deliberate ceremony to get that communication and alignment. And um, just like with Scrum, you should always be evaluating whether you're doing too much or too little and if you need to change anything. Um, but I think, I think it's just a balance, right? I don't think we need to do daily stand-ups at the portfolio level, for example. That doesn't make sense. But doing retrospectives, right, that seems we could all agree that those are valuable. Um, so let's let's do it right. So I guess it's it's you know safe prescribes certain ceremonies and that seems to be somewhat minimal. Um, but again, I encourage you to 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 not take that as the only way to do it and to um, work as an organization to make sure you're you're getting that communication and alignment minimally, right? So whatever ceremonies you need to do to make sure that happens are important, in my opinion. Yeah, and if I could just just piggyback on that, um, and it's actually a question that came up during during my certification course uh, for Safe, and and you know Dean Luffingwell answered that uh, rather emphatically that the fact that Safe is not um, it, it is a framework, right? It it is not a, a list of um, you know thou must do this stuff, right? It's it's uh, just like Scrum in that you know hey if it's not working for you or if you your, your particular organization wants to, to modify it, go for it. Uh, interesting talking about communication, and I think we're getting really to the nut of the matter here with this great question from one of the attendees. How do you deal with face-to-face -face communication and getting all the right people to work together when so many people are already overwhelmed with business workload? Uh, ooh, interesting. That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> Yeah, it was actually a couple questions in there too, I think. Um, and then it raises more questions in my mind, like why is the business so busy that they can't have time for face-to-face -face -to -face communication, right? right. Um, uh, I'll take a shot at that. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the main thing there is you need commitment from, from the business side and whoever's um, – working in, in this construct um, to, to make the time for these ceremonies and or face-to-face -face communication, right? The key is the business side and the developers, um, development teams need to be working together, right? And, and um, it, it's got to be a priority, and especially when we're, work, we're trying to coordinate big systems and big deliveries across big initiatives, right? It becomes even more important. 
So again, uh, uh, being somewhat facetious, but I, I'd go back to um, questioning the business side as to why is it that you have so much work in progress that you don't have time to communicate, right? And maybe that's part of the, um, you know, the too much work in progress portion that we talked about. And the other part of it is the, the work in progress they should be working on should be relevant to the people they should be communicating with. So if they're working on something else that's not part of our core initiative, um, then I would question that also. Sorry, somewhat ancillary, but I, I thought that was relevant. But good question. Oh, absolutely. You know, I know a lot of organizations are dealing with the, you know, do more with less mentality that, uh, you know, came up uh, over the last few years as the economy wasn't as great as we wanted it to be. So, uh, you know, maybe they're mm -hmm. stuck in that kind of mode. I don't know. But yeah. that was a very good answer. Uh, so it looks like we're kind of running down on time. I'll ask another question and then give you guys a couple of uh, seconds each to uh, share some final thoughts. So uh, one, one of the attendees wants to know uh, simply, uh, can you suggest any uh, you know, agile management tools uh, that they can use? Um, well, you know, mm -hmm. version one makes a great product. I heard um, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, are, there are multiple tools out there. Um, um, you know, sort of the, you know, and I, I happen to work for version one, Dave and I both, so I mean, you're going you're gonna to hear that first and foremost, but, you know, we, we've got competitors. Um, Rally is, is another big player in, in the, uh, the market, and they, they've got a good, good tool as well. Um, Dave, what, what are some of the others that you've run across? Um, yeah, I, I think there, there are quite a few others. Uh, Mingle is another one. Um, there's sort of a small handful, though, that have really dealt with, you know, scaling, right, and being able to manage at these different levels. So, um, in fact, the, the next uh, part two of this series, we're going to be talking a little bit more about version one and starting to see how we can manage this, these kinds of things in the tool. So look forward to that. How far can people go without tools? Mm. Just try to implement some processes. I, I think I think it, it starts becoming more and more difficult when you go beyond the team level, right? Once you start getting above, up above you know, um, you know, five, ten teams, it, it starts becoming less and less manageable at that point. That's just my opinion. Well, that that makes sense. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. If not sooner than that, beyond a team, oftentimes it gets tough. Okay. So, uh, you know, as Dave uh, and Laurie both had mentioned earlier, if we didn't get to your question here during the uh, live Q&A, uh, I know they're going to respond to uh, each and every inquiry. So uh, look out in your email in the coming days, and uh, I'm sure they'll be communicating with you. So, uh, Mike, if you would, we'll start with you and then go to Dave. Uh, any, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so with any final thoughts, last takeaways you want people to have? Oh gosh, I, I don't know if I can even do 30 seconds. Um, it just, it's, this has been fun. Um, I've never done a, a webinar with this many people on before. It was really cool. And um, I, I'm just uh, happy to, to share some of my experience and knowledge uh, uh, in scaling Agile at the program and portfolio level. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, this is Dave here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, had a great time. It's it's a big topic, um, as you know, and it's great to be a part of uh, disseminating some information about it. Um, and I guess the one thing I'd like to close with is that is just the recognition that it, it's complex and it's a journey, right? And so you know, and there's a lot of change that needs to happen that you can plan for. Um, a lot of times it happens organically, and but now I think we're recognizing that you can step back, look at these four areas and come up with a plan and get buy-in that this is a direction we're going and these are the kinds of steps that we need to get to and go mm -hmm. through. Um, Great. And with that, just real quick, I, I missed a slide earlier, Dave. Um, we are going to accept emails from you guys, anybody who attended the webinar, um, to um, give us a, a description of what your big challenges are around scaling, a little more than just one of the four categories but actually give us a synopsis of kind of what, where are your pain points right now when scaling, right? And if you send us an email to this address, um, we're going to give away a free on-site Agile assessment. So um, one of our consultants and coaches will come out and work with your organization, um, do an assessment, and help you start to come up with that roadmap of how to, how to get past some of your challenges. Um, so lots of value there. 
And if you're a consultant or an industry analyst or, or someone else, we'll do something similar with you and, and maybe a partnership along these same lines. So don't forget to send an email, describe your issues, and we'll, um, we'll provide some more detail in a follow-up email as well. Thank That's you for having super. us today. Super. And I also would like to thank everybody for attending today. And on behalf of Version 1 and uh, SD Times, uh, we hope you'll join us next week for Part 2 of the Agile series. And uh, as Laurie said earlier, this will be available live uh, for on-demand viewing as many times as you like, uh, I guess, within the next week or so on the uh, Version 1 website. Okay, until then, again, I'm Dave Rubenstein. Thanks, everybody. Take care. <laughs>